Welcome to Waters World. I'm Jesse Waters. Backfiring activism, that is the subject of tonight's Waters Words. Hardcore Democratic activists are threatening to overwhelm the rest of the party. They disrupt peaceful events, make threats, and cause violence. This week we saw a teenager attacked for wearing a Make America Great Again hat. That teen's going to join me later for an exclusive interview. On July 4th in Lower Manhattan, Americans were sightseeing with their families, celebrating our independence, and preparing to watch the fireworks. Suddenly, a radical African immigrant activist began scaling the Statue of Liberty. The woman, part of the Trump resistance movement, refused to come down. Police and firemen were deployed. The entire Liberty Island, filled with 4,000 tourists, was evacuated. The statue was closed. 3,000 visitors were turned away on the monument's busiest day of the year. Because one selfish individual didn't agree with President Trump's immigration policy. And after a four-hour standoff, she was arrested. Teresa Como, born in the Congo, was slapped with a few misdemeanor charges. She's probably not even going to spend a day in jail. Now, after costing the city tax dollars and man hours, diverting valuable police resources from fighting real crime and ruining thousands of Americans' visit to the Statue of Liberty on July 4th, President Trump weighed in at a rally earlier in Montana. You saw that clown yesterday on the Statue of Liberty? I would have said, let's get some nets and let's wait till she comes down. Just get some nets. Really, yeah. This self-centered stunt artist has a wacky past. She's filed several seemingly frivolous racial discrimination lawsuits against various entities. She had run-ins with neighbors. She's been slapped with nearly $5,000 in fines by the Department of Sanitation. She's also been arrested for trespassing and assaulting a police officer. And following her release from jail this week, Okomo said she was inspired by Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. Our beloved first lady that I care so much about said when they go low, we go high. And I went as high as I could. <laughs> Trump has wrecked this country apart. Nothing you can say to me will justify putting children in cages. Only a stupid, unintelligent, coward, and insecure, I will add, a maniac, will whip a tender age child from its mother. First of all, I don't think Michelle Obama wants your endorsement. Second, the photo of a child in a cage, that image she's talking about, was from 2014. The Obama administration did that. Trump didn't put that kid in a cage. Fake news is now causing real rage. We all want families to stay together, so let's all work together to achieve that goal, while at the same time protecting our border and protecting children from fake parent human smugglers. And radical Democrat activist tactics have turned regular Americans against their party and their cause. You'll remember Black Lives Matter protesters disrupted the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade while parents were celebrating the holiday with their young kids. Occupy Wall Street protesters who wanted higher income for workers shut down traffic in Detroit so people couldn't commute to work on time and earn their income. Left-wingers who were screaming about Trump's rhetoric on Muslims and immigrants caused mayhem during his inauguration and firebombed a limo owned by a Muslim immigrant. Idiots. Democrats protested an ICE raid in Oakland. ICE is not welcome in this country. HSI is not welcome. We're going to fight back. We're not going to let people just disappear like this. Turns out ICE was conducting a raid on human sex traffickers. Democrats actually rallied against this. You can't make this stuff up. So after the family separation controversy at the border and all the recent street action by Maxine Waters's left-wingers, Trump's approval rating is up with Hispanics. It's up 10 points. This according to a Harvard-Harris poll released just a few days ago. Amazing, isn't it? And now the most important issue determining people's votes in the midterms? Immigration, largely driven by Republican enthusiasm. 
So Democrats, your radical tactics are backfiring. Be careful what you wish for. Here to react, 2012 Republican presidential candidate and Fox News contributor, Herman Cain. So, Mr. Cain, what would you have done with that woman that scaled the Statue of Liberty if you were in charge? Well, I would have waited until she got hungry enough <laughs> and thirsty enough to voluntarily come down. The human body <laughs> can only take so much hunger and thirst, and I would have just waited her out. Just waited her out and <laughs> starved her out. But at this, then the, yes. they wouldn't have been able to go up and tour the Statue of Liberty. Everyone exactly. wouldn't have been able to visit. You're right. That whole incident, Jesse, was just another example of, and I know these words are harsh, another example of the ignorant narrative of abolish ICE. It's ignorant because most people who are claiming they want to abolish ICE, they have no idea what ICE does. One third of ICE's activities revolve around immigration and the border. Two thirds revolve around fighting, crime, drugs, sex trafficking, and a whole lot of other things. They have no idea. You're so exactly right. And we just following and, a narrative. Yes. We just showed that video of those protesters. They actually were protesting an ICE raid on a human sex trafficking ring yes. in the interior of the country in Oakland, California, or, you know, north of the southern border. They don't get it. And it's these people that are turning regular Americans against their cause. We saw that with Black Lives Matter when they were yes. disrupting things. We saw that with Occupy Wall Street. All these little protest movements, they start off, uh, you know, righteous cause against police brutality. Uh, you know, they want higher wages, but their tactics are so rude and disrespectful. These, these are now movements are so marginalized that no one takes them seriously anymore. You're absolutely right. Uh, in, in the case of Abolish ICE, Jesse, I don't even call it a movement yet. It is simply an ignorant narrative. And a lot of people, unfortunately, they're falling for it because I don't believe that these protests are spontaneous. I believe that they are manufactured. And in order to have a manufactured protest or multiple protests across, across the country, somebody is paying somebody to make it happen and maybe even some of the protesters. I'm well, just saying. You're exactly right, because I looked into this and the resist Trump or what rise and resist, whatever this woman's group was. If you go down to the bottom below what they stand for, there's a little donation thing from Act Blue. And, you know, Act Blue is this big kind of mainstream media, mainstream Democrat you know, financial clearinghouse where they run all the donations through. And I, I looked into what Resist and Rise or whatever it is stands for. They want to get rid of nukes. They want to get rid of Sean Hannity. They idolize right. Stormy Daniels. They're for kneeling during the national anthem and they want to oust the Trump regime, whatever that means, <laughs> Mr. Cain. It's called anarchy. Anarchy begins with creating as much violence disruption and distortion in the society as you possibly can. But here's the good news, Jesse. They, a lot of people are responding to the narrow lens of the media as I described. Yep. They put the narrow lens of the liberal media on all of these fringe protest activities, people climbing up to the base of the Statue of Liberty. Yep. That does not represent America. The numbers you quoted sure earlier. Doesn't about President Trump's approval rating going up with Hispanics. They're going up with everybody. Why? Because real people with real sense are falling for this malarkey. That is the good news in the middle of all of this chaos. Yes, America is resisting the resistance. Mr. Cain, yes. thank you very much. Happy to be with you, Jesse. Now, Hollywood liberals feeling less than patriotic on all days the 4th of July. Chelsea Handler tweeting, to every country on the 4th of July. We're sorry about our president. He doesn't reflect all of our views, and we hope you know that the majority of us are ashamed. We will rally each other and come back to the world one step at a time. Michael Moore said this, Happy Resistance Day. The revolt continues some 242 years later. Come on, people, let's finish this. Ooh. 
And not to be left out, Dan Rather wrote on this 4th of July, I refuse to let Donald Trump have the flag of the United States as his own. I refuse to have the Pledge of Allegiance sullied by the jingoism and divisions of our present national leaders. I refuse to have the Star Spangled Banner used as a cudgel against principled speech. I refuse to let the best of this nation be debased and weaponized against truth and justice. I refuse to bow to cynicism. So why aren't liberals proud of America on the 4th of July? Joining me now, former senior advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Philippe Reines, and conservative commentator Gina Loudon, who is a member of President Trump's media advisory board. So Gina, I'll start with you. Do Democrats have a patriotism problem? Well, polling suggests that perhaps they do. Polling suggests that, in fact, Democrats uh, tend to be patriotic based upon who is actually occupying the White House rather than the founding principles of America, such as the Constitution, the struggles of our founding fathers to establish our country, those kinds of things. That's what uh, conservatives tend to base their patriotism on. And not only that, Jesse, Democrats feel more patriotic when they're doing things like protesting, uh, when they, they actually, 51% of them, I believe, said that they believed a patriotic thing to do was to break a law or to refuse to go to a war or to burn a flag. So you can see that the lines are very different between what Democrats and perhaps conservatives or Republicans consider patriotism. Yeah, Philippe, uh, I mean, wow. Um, burning a flag <laughs> is patriotic, breaking laws are patriotic. I don't think that's what most Americans believe, do you? Well, most Americans don't approve of what Donald Trump is doing. You know, you can cite polls where his numbers are going up. His numbers are still abysmal. He is someone so wait, what who does ran. that have to do with uh, patriotism? Well, I don't think any of this has anything to do with patriotism. July 4th is not just about bottle rockets and hot dogs. 242 years ago, it was the ultimate protest telling King George that we're not going to have any more of this. I think what's as divisive, if not more so, is other things that were going on July 4th. To talk about the, the uh, poll that both you and Dr. Gina were just referring to, your own Britt Hume made it, uh, sent a tweet that he had to later take back because it was unfair to label Democrats as being unpatriotic. Well, you know, before we get into whatever Britt Hume said, I'm not familiar with that, let's actually take a look at the poll. And this is from Gallup. National pride dropping among Democrats. Now, if you look at 2018, just 32% of Democrats, proud Americans, Republicans, 74%. But I mean, from 2013, you know, it's gone down by, you know, more than 20 points. That was when Barack Obama was president. Republicans have pretty much stayed the same. I mean, what do you account for that? Well, the bulk of the drop started in 2015 forward, and the bulk of the Republican spike has started in 2015 forward. It's not this much is of a spike, come on. Well, but this is essentially a referendum on Donald Trump. Uh, th these numbers about pride have been going down since before 9-11 with both parties. Look, not in an ideal world- Not as much world, on the Democrat side true. compared to the Republican side. Let's, let, let, let because me move this on is now. a referendum on Donald Trump. I, I, don't think, I really don't think it is because he wasn't president in 2015, Philippe. Now, um, I, I honestly do think the Democrats have a uh, patriotism problem, Gina, because when you talk about what they did with the Neil during the national anthem, they sided with them. You know, a lot of people on the left and the media sided with Kim Jong-un against Donald Trump. And we saw Bill Maher the other day rooting for an economic recession. It just seems to me, based upon their behavior and their rhetoric, that they don't like America when it's robust, when it's succeeding, and when it's, you know, patriotic. Or is that too large of a jump? I, I wish it weren't, Jesse. I, I hate the whole thing, to be honest with you. I think all the time, I, I feel like if we could sit down, Republicans and Democrats, and have a conversation, I don't think there's that much we disagree about. But I do think the rhetoric of the leadership, of the media, and of the Hollywood elite um, is influencing people who are participating in these polls to say some outlandish things. And even Philippe didn't deny when I said that some Democrats' patriotism is based on uh, burning a flag or on protesting or uh, refusing to go to war and those kinds of things. So, 
or breaking a law. And so yeah. if, if that's the kind of thing they're basing it on, Jesse, it's a sad day in America yeah, for and them. I, I don't want to sit here and, and diminish anybody's patriotism. I don't want to question anybody's patriotism. I'm not. just looking at the behavior. And when you protest July 4th, when you protest Columbus Day, um, you know, when you, when you kneel during the national anthem, it's just a lot of people get the wrong idea. Philippe, when people what's, do that, that's that's what, all we're saying. You know, what, it, I, what idea do people get when Alex Jones of Infowars says that the Democratic Party is about to launch a civil war on July 4th? What message does it send when the right attacks NPR for tweeting out the Declaration of Independence one at a time? What kind of <laughs> message does it send I, I don't, when Donald Trump... I don't remember those things, but I do know that, that <laughs> Bill Maher... I mean, I do know that Bill... Uh, but, but Moore... Uh, Michael Moore said, oh, let's revolt. Let's finish it this time. These that sounded like he was calling of, for uh, a little violent action against uh, King Trump. Look, but here, I got to leave the... it at that. Guys, <laughs> both of you two are very patriotic in my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You too, Jesse. Coming up, Ben Shapiro on the Supreme Court picks and a Waters World exclusive. The boy attacked for wearing his Make America Great Again hat is here. Stick around.
with Vladimir Putin to make Russia great again. And I, I, what I don't understand... He's been a lot harsher on Putin than Obama was, by the way. Harsher on Putin? You got, he, Not in terms of his rhetoric, in he, terms of his actions. He has, armed, he has armed the people of Ukraine with deadly weaponry, which Obama would not do. 200 Russian soldiers were killed in Syria by U.S. forces under Donald Trump, not under Barack yeah, Obama. That, it was Barack Obama who was saying to Dmitry Medvedev that he wanted to provide him with flexibility in 2012. It, Crimea was annexed under Barack Obama. Ben Shapiro in the liberal lion's den this week with Bill Maher, the editor-in-chief of DailyWire.com, joins me now. Now, I think the only reason you really stumped him there, Ben, was because he was high. He smokes before the show we're hearing. That might have uh, accounted for him not being able to respond that quickly. But I want to talk to you about the top three SCOTUS picks that President Trump's ruminating about. Tell me what your assessment is of Brett Kavanaugh, who seems to be the early establishment insider frontrunner. So I'm a little bit dicey on Brett Kavanaugh, and, and the reason is not just because he's sort of the Bush insider pick. He's obviously very close with the Bush team. He was one of the, the forces behind the selection of John Roberts. But there are two specific cases in which Brett Kavanaugh uh, has, has, I think, done less than, than originalists would like. So in one particular case, he denied jurisdiction on Obamacare because he said that Obamacare was actually a tax. It was the first time anybody had made the argument that Obamacare was a tax rather than a fine. And as you'll recall, that was the logic that ended up being used by Chief Justice Roberts in determining that Obamacare was in fact legal under the Constitution. So the, the original logic for that came from a Kavanaugh dissent uh, in a case called Seven Well, Sky. that's not a there's good thing. Case. Very concerning to a lot of people. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there's another case called Priest for Life in which Kavanaugh suggests that the government had a compelling government interest in providing contraceptive care via insurance to folks. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of critics who suggest that that, that case uh, is, is a little bit of evidence that he takes too seriously the government's stated interests in a particular leftist social issues. But he is considered a, a strong conservative choice. The Wall Street Journal editorial page endorsed him. Uh, Matt Schlapp, uh, American Conservative Union, has also endorsed him. It wouldn't be a, a bad pick. You're saying we could do better. And one of the people I've heard you discuss is Amy Barrett, who I think now a lot of the social conservatives and the the uh, constitutional conservatives are really getting behind at the last minute. She seemed to be surging. What are you hearing about her? Uh, so the, the truth is that Coney Barrett's actual judicial resume is very short because she's only been on a federal circuit court for about a year ever since she had those really contentious hearings with Democrats where they accused her of having the doctrine live loudly within her and Catholicism was going to rule the day and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, so uh, what we know about her is that she, she's written a lot uh, in terms of academic writing. Uh, a lot of her academic writing has centered on originalism and textualism. She's a big supporter of the doctrines and, and philosophies of Justice Scalia. She's obviously personally very right. pro-life. Uh, and uh, and so yeah, and she and she's, clerked again, for Scalia and she's only she what, 46 years old. So that would Correct. be a very, very long time on the bench if she ever was appointed and Catholic person. Uh, like you said, an originalist really interprets the Constitution as it was written. Um, and now we're hearing about Raymond Kethledge. Now, Raymond Kethledge, the third person, he was the runner up to Gorsuch. And um, now he's making a late surge, too. He clerked for Kennedy, uh, University of Michigan guy. What do you know about him? Well, so Kethledge's resume is quite good. Uh, his, his decisions are very strong. They're well-worded. Uh, he, he tends to write strong opinions. I, I would say that Brett Kavanaugh's opinions are very uh, politically inclined in the sense that he's attempting to create sort of cohesion on the court. Uh, Kethledge's opinions are, are a lot more kind of punch you in the nose opinions. Uh, he has a very strong record on the Second Amendment in particular. Uh, he also has a very strong record with regard to something called Chevron deference, which is the idea that when an administrative agency makes a judgment that that can still be, the, the, the Chevron deference suggests it shouldn't be overruled by the judiciary. He says the judiciary is a separate branch and the judiciary should overrule what the judiciary has to overrule, which I think is correct. Okay. I think Kethledge is, is a strong candidate. Okay, so if you were to rank the most conservative to the least conservative, or the person that you would like to see on the bench the most, you probably would choose Barrett, number one. I'm hearing maybe Kethledge two, Kavanaugh three. Do I have that right? That's that's right, yeah. Okay, but all, all solid picks. Um, to replace Justice Kennedy, who was the swing justice. All right, now. I think that's right. right. I think that's right. Although I would say that the best, the best shot that one of them ends up being Roberts is probably Kavanaugh. Yeah, Roberts, not, not the best, but still really not that bad. Um, and this new memo we're seeing uh, from Peter Strzok, our old friend at the FBI, something that we've just uncovered. You know, I don't know why this didn't come up in the IG report or any of the other requests to turn over these 
memos and text messages, there was something that said, hurry the F up to pressure to probe the Trump campaign. And this was in the fall 2016. So he's talking about hurrying this thing up, obviously politically motivated and electorally motivated. What is your thinking behind that? It's just more and more nonsense or what? It's not a shock at all. I mean, Michael Horowitz in that IG report suggested that Peter Strzok was making decisions to privilege the, the timing of the Trump investigation above the Hillary investigation. In fact, one of the reasons they say that the Hillary investigation, the reopening of the Hillary email investigation was delayed until late October is because Strzok wanted to place focus on the Trump investigation because he wanted to get it done before the actual election took place. Strzok is a political actor. There's no question about this. And even Horowitz essentially suggested as much in that much maligned IG report. So. Uh, it, it looks, you know, if, if, the, if the FBI was not out to get President Trump, it certainly looks like Peter Strzok was. Right. And he was too much of a political hack to be on the Mueller team. I don't see why that reasoning wouldn't, um, you know, disallow him from being on the Comey team. So either way, he's poisoned it. It's just a matter of how far they're going to take that. Now, um, the DNC chairman, Perez. Um, he was asked about this woman out of the Bronx, uh, Ocasio-Cortez, who is an abolish ICE activist, an avowed socialist. And here is what the chairman of the DNC said about an avowed socialist. Listen. I have three kids, two of whom are our daughters. Uh, one just graduated college, one is in college, and they were both uh, uh, texting me about their excitement over Alexandria because you know, she really she represents the future of our party. So if socialism is the future of the Democratic Party, Ben, I don't think the Democratic Party has a future because that's not good. Uh, well, you know, I, I think the Democratic Party obviously has moved radically left in terms of identity politics and intersectionality. And uh, Ocasio-Cortez represents sort of the merger of the intersectional wing of the Democratic Party with the Bernie Sanders socialist wing of the Democratic Party. And while it's easy to dismiss the socialism of the Democratic Party, the truth is that we live in a country that tends to swing back and forth between the parties. It's, it's not good for the country that the Democratic Party has moved so far to the left that they're now outflanking some European left-wing parties because you have to imagine at some point they, these, these jokers could be back in power. Well, I mean, remember what happened with Barack Obama. He took the country way far left, and you saw a huge rebellion with the Tea Party. They destroyed the Democratic bench nationally. Uh, they're totally out of power. So uh, we saw what happened there. You know, I just can't believe it. Hopefully it doesn't swing that far to the left, Ben. Got to run. Thanks so much. Up next, a socialist who disagrees with everything Ben and I just said is here to defend socialism. Buckle up.
live from America's News Headquarters, I'm Marianne Rafferty. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Tokyo speaking alongside the foreign ministers of Japan and South Korea just a short time ago. His remarks come after another trip to Pyongyang for denuclearization talks. South Korea slamming negotiations with Pompeo, calling them, quote, regrettable and gangster-like. I am determined to achieve the commitment that President Trump made, and I am counting on Chairman Kim to be determined to follow through on the commitment that he made. Uh, and so if those requests were gangster like they are, the, the world is a gangster because there was a unanimous decision at the UN Security Council about what needs to be achieved. Pompeo also saying that North Korea sanctions will remain in place until the country is completely free of nuclear weapons. I'm Marianne Rafferty. Now back to Waters World. That's the new rallying cry from uh, socialists at the weekend's socialism convention in Chicago. Democratic millennials moving towards socialism in mass. But is the movement the future or the destruction of the Democratic Party? Joining me now, Mimi Solsitic, who was a 2016 presidential candidate for the Socialist Party USA. All right, Mimi, I just want to go slowly here because socialism confuses me a little bit. Has socialism worked anywhere it's been tried? I think what we're um, working toward is something that we've yet to see. Uh, socialism did they, at its core did they try means socialism? worker ownership and control okay. over uh, uh, production. All right. So I think it's important that you understand what it means and that your viewers understand what it means. Okay. So we're capable of progress. Okay. You know? So did they try socialism in Venezuela? You know, it's funny that I, I expected you to bring up Venezuela. It's such a weak talking point. You're talking to somebody who lives in a city that's got over 50,000 homeless people. So this diversion over to Venezuela. Oh, no, I'm just asking where now. has socialism worked? Has it worked in Cuba? Okay. Has it worked in, so, so, in the well, let's Soviet look at Cuba's Union? Literacy rate. Look, sure, let me, let me respond. Let's look at Cuba's literacy rate. Let's look at their health care. You know, let's look at countries that have universal health care and how they rank against the United States health care well, system. I mean, they have they far outrank in terms socialist of health care in Canada this. and a lot of the rich Canadians come to America to get their surgery. But let me let, let's just move the on. Last time the world. Let's just move on. Let's, you I don't need want to, to get, move on because you're okay. wrong. OK, that's your opinion. And you don't even care that you're wrong, which is bizarre. No, I don't believe I'm wrong, but that's fine. We can move on. I just don't want to get bogged down on other countries. Let's focus on America here. You want let's do that. socialism to replace capitalism here in America? Of course I do. I mean, uh, to say that I, I, I'm a socialist, that I don't want to see an end to oppression and exploitation, of okay. course I want to see so socialism replace how, capitalism. I pay about 50% in taxes to the government. How high would you like to see my taxes raised to? I, we would support a steeply graduated progressive income tax How much? as it stands right now the u.s Maybe. has i mean let's can, just take me for an example can you stop what interrupting you, me for a second no i'm just i'm trying to move the conversation forward i want to get specific on your policy sure. what would you like to see well, me pay you know, in taxes? okay let's say this I don't know how much you earn, but let's just say hypothetically it's a million dollars, right? Let's say you were taxed at 70%. If you can't get by on $300,000 <laughs> in a country where 70%? so many are, are struggling just... <laughs> let me finish. This is why you're having a problem Man. right now. This smug smarminess in the face of suffering, it's not resonating with folks. Your days are over. Well, listen, I would say this. I would say in the countries that have socialist policies, there's more suffering in China, in Cuba, in Venezuela, and the Soviet Union, that system didn't work. And it wasn't those countries, and it's not those countries that feed the world and protect the world. It's the United States of America, and we have capitalism at its foundation. The United States destroys the world. The we United destroy States the world? feeds and protects the world? 
Are, you got to be kidding me. Conservative estimates since World War II <laughs> show right. that the U.S. has killed at least 20 million people since World War II. The United well, States is an imperialist country. Its riches are I built on the backs I don't know what you would have done with Nazi Germany. The developing world. I don't know what you would have done with Nazi yeah, Germany, but I think America just, made the right decision there. Are, 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 are so weak. Mimi, I will have you back on and we'll give you more time and we can discuss things in more specific. But we, you know what? We got to pay the bills because we got to sell advertising. We got to have a commercial break. I know you right? do. Thank you very much. Up next, Diamond and Silk on Pocahontas, Low IQ Maxine, and Sinbad. Stick around.
During his Montana rally on Thursday, President Trump launched his latest attack on Elizabeth Warren, he calls her Pocahontas, challenging the Massachusetts senator to prove her Native American claims. When I announce, they are going to endorse me. Because if I lose, should I lose? Or if I don't run, they're out of business. Who's going to cover? They're going to cover Bernie? Hey, they're going to cover, like, sleepy Joe Biden? They're going to cover Pocahontas, who was... Think of it. Think of it. She of the great tribal heritage. What tribe is it? Uh, let me think about that one. <laughs> Meantime, she's based her life on being a minority. Pocahontas, they always want me to apologize for saying it. And I hereby, oh no, I want to apologize, I'll use tonight. Pocahontas, I apologize to you. I apologize. To you, I apologize. To the, to the fake Pocahontas, I won't about it. No, it's causing her problems. You know, that name's good. Because now even the liberals are saying, take a test. Take a test. You know, the, I tell you, I, I shouldn't tell you, because I like not to give away secrets. But this one. Let's say I'm debating Pocahontas, right? I promise you I'll do this. I will take, you know those little kits they sell on television for $2? I'm going to get one of those little kits. And in the middle of the debate, when she proclaims that she's of Indian heritage because her mother said she has high cheekbones. That's her only evidence, that her mother said she had high cheekbones. We will very gently take that kit and we will slowly toss it, hoping it doesn't hit her and injure her arm. Even though it only weighs probably two ounces. And we will say, I will give you a million dollars to your favorite charity, paid for by Trump, if you take the test and it shows you're an Indian. Joining me now with their thoughts, Diamond and Silk. Wow, that, ladies, was one of the best performances I've seen the president deliver in a while. Do you think uh, Pocahontas is going to take the test? She should come clean. Yes. The president had us rolling, but Pocahontas or Elizabeth Warren should come clean about her heritage. Yes. And she should also come clean about what's going on down there at the border. She should come clean and instead of blaming President Trump, she need to also come clean and let everybody know how they were being hypocrites, how she was being hypocritical because she did not protest against Obama and his administration when he had children locked up in cages. That's true. Uh, and I don't mean to disparage her when I call her Pocahontas. I'm just mimicking the president a little bit, having a little fun. And she brought that controversy on herself and she could easily put it to rest. But something tells me I don't think she's going to take the test. I don't know why. I want to well, ask you guys um, another question about the president's mm -hmm. performance at that Montana rally. Check out what he said about your friend, who I know you guys are tracking down somewhere, Maxine Waters. Roll it. I said it the other day, yes, she is a low IQ individual, Maxine Waters. I said it the other day. I, I mean, honestly, she's somewhere in the mid-60s, I believe that. He will be impeached. I will impeach him. Even the Democrats are saying, how are you saying that? They don't want to use that word because it gets the Republicans out the vote. They say, stay away from that word. Especially since he's done nothing wrong. That helps also, right? Yeah, now Maxine's in a little bit of a beef with some of the top Democrats. You know, Chuck Schumer told her to pipe down with all the crazy talk about Russian people out of restaurants. And now a bunch of black Democrats are saying, hey, you know, leave uh, Maxine alone, crying Chuck. It's just uh, a little civil war over there on the Democratic side. What do you guys think? Oh, yes, it is. And the president is right. Yeah. Maxine Waters' uh, IQ is very low. Anytime a congresswoman go around and she's we, we look at her as a domestic terrorist. She's telling Americans to attack other Americans. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. But you know what? Maxine Waters and her rhetoric is like the gift that keeps on giving to the Republican Party. So we want her to keep talking. That's right. Because she represents the party of divisiveness. That is true. She does uh, help Republicans a lot. I wouldn't go so far as to call her a domestic terrorist that might be a little over the line but uh you know um lastly remember sinbad from back in the day yeah well we do sinbad uh, I, I think he he popped out of the pirate ship and re-emerged on some cable news station and uh took some shots at the president's twitter habits let's listen 
He loves being able to, to Twitter slam people because you don't have to see him face to face. Mm. He's not good with that. Uh, are you suggesting um, that not unlike Drake's observation, people with Twitter fingers sometimes aren't as hardcore when you meet them in person? Oh, man, they're keyboard gangsters, man. Most keyboard gangsters, man, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt a fly, brother. That's why they live behind the keyboard. <laughs> keyboard gangster, President Trump. What do you think about the Sinbad's uh, assessment? Well, you know, what's wrong with Sinbad is he's trying to revamp his career, so that's why he's name-dropping the president. Yeah. But what he need to do is think about his own self. Look at his own self. We here in this world, and he's still living in a different world or in another world. Mm -hmm. He need to come come back to earth and listen we don't look at him as a comedian we look at him as nothing but a joke <laughs> well, I don't I don't think I don't think other people look at him as a comedian anymore either ladies all right gotta run diamond and silk everybody up next an exclusive interview with a 16 year old who was attacked for being a Trump supporter more and more people are finding themselves in a shed
against Trump supporters. This time, a 16-year-old boy was attacked by a man at a San Antonio Whataburger simply for wearing his Make America Great Again hat. Watch. You ain't support Okay. This is gonna go great in my Unbelievable. Hunter Richard is the proud American who was bullied, and now he joins me in a Waters World exclusive interview. So, Hunter, did you say anything to provoke this? Were you talking about anything, or did he just come out of the blue? So before the, he actually came over and immediately ripped off my hat off my head, I don't believe any of my friends or even me made eye contact with him. Were you talking about anything that may have alarmed him? Did you, were you talking about the wall? Were you talking about, I don't know, <laughs> Little Rocket Man? What, what were you saying? I believe the conversation when he came over was about Pokemon. We saw some funny thing on Twitter. Okay, so totally unprovoked. And this guy's now been arrested and he has quite a little rap sheet. He's got a past arrest for DWI marijuana, burglary, so he's not a good guy and he's been fired from his job. Do you, did you feel scared when he came over? Did you have any idea that he was coming over in an aggressive fashion? Uh, I had no clue he was coming over and I don't know where, like, he just, I saw his hand come over. Uh, it, he ripped the hat off my head, basically bear clawed it. Uh, he kind of like pulled my head a little bit and then, I, yeah, I was pretty shocked. I, was, I felt a little bit threatened. So he threw the soda right in your face Yes. Did you think about doing anything? He looked a little bit bigger than you. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, he was definitely bigger than me. That's, that's kind of the whole funny thing. This, you know, 30-year-old guy, an adult, knows that he can pick on a bunch of teenagers, so he thought, oh, this is going to be funny, and yeah. So you've pressed charges against this guy? Are you plan on pressing charges? Um, so we went to the police. We gave a statement and everything. Uh, I think it was basically out of our hands whether or not we were going to press charges. Uh, I believe he, the charges we pressed were for a, a theft. For, for theft, because he stole the hat. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, you know, I probably, after this airs, you might get a, a hat sent to you, maybe a thousand hats. or you know, <laughs> I'm sure you'll have a, a nice little uh, Make America Great Again hat collection after this incident. I'm glad oh, you're yeah. okay. Um, anything you want to say to this guy or to people watching at home? Um, I just say that this isn't acceptable. The whole reason that I'm doing this is that no person should think this is acceptable and that they can get away with it. But I do say, though, that people make mistakes. So I'm not really holding against this guy. He made a mistake. And, uh, yeah, just, just, just an, it, this is not acceptable. All right, Hunter. Very uh, mature reaction. I probably wouldn't have reacted that way or said that. But uh, <laughs> I appreciate your uh, civility. Thank All you very right, thank much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Up next, last call. Feel like you do ballet. Yeah. Hold tight when you tilt so.
Time now for Last Call. Nearly 40 million Americans hit the road this week for the 4th of July holiday, and for some New Jersey drivers, it was terrifying. Yes, ma'am. Now gone off the road again. He's now gone off the roadway again. He's gone sideways. He's now crashed into the other side, oncoming traffic. Pull away now. He's actually pulling away, going now, now, uh, up the road, eastbound. Oh, he just crashed into a car. He just ran a, a, a white uh, car off the road. Now the cops finally got him, and the brave guy who filmed all this is a New Jersey local who followed the wild ride for 15 miles before the police pulled him over. He had a little dash can there. Looks like police say he was driving high on heroin. Unbelievable, but he's off the road. Thank God. That's all for us tonight. Be sure to follow.